things. This week, we, we start to look at how these uh, states of chitta are attained. In particular, how the higher states of chitta are attained using the practice of samatha, meditation, and certain objects which are suitable for this practice. So the word samadhi or samatha is important. The other word which is important is the word jhana. The Sanskrit word is dhyana. It has two meanings. The first is to contemplate a particular object and to examine its characteristics closely. And the second is to eliminate hindrances. Not one meaning of jhana is to burn. It burns away defilements in the mind. So to attain what we call jhana chittas, we have to practice according to samatha meditation, samatha bhavana. And to do this, if it's being undertaken by a very serious committed meditator, first of all, the meditation object has to match the character of the meditator. And we recognize six different kinds of character. The first three are described by terms I think we're already familiar with. The first one is somebody who is lustful or greedy or passionate. Pali word is raga or loba. The second type is hateful or angry. That's dosa. And the third type is deluded or ignorant. That is moha. The next three have some qualities in common with the first three. So number four is the faithful character or sadha. Number five is the intellectual or intelligent character, buddhi. And number six is the agitated, speculative or pondering character, vitaka. And these kinds of character can be assessed by a meditation teacher watching how the pupil conducts uh, his daily activities, like how he dresses, how he eats, how he sleeps, sweeps the floor, um, just mundane activities. But the way we perform these actions can reveal the kind of character we have. I would emphasize that these characters are not judgmental. We're not saying that one character is better or worse than another. But the, both the lustful and the faithful types have in common a favorable attitude towards the object. One is unwholesome, and one is wholesome. Both of these are gentle, polite, clean, neat, tidy. Both are fond of luxury. They prefer sweet, aromatic, and tender food. But the, the lustful character is attached to sense pleasures. 
is cunning, proud, and greedy. Whereas the faithful character is truthful, honest, and generous. The second pair are the hateful and the intellectual types. They both turn away from an object in an unwholesome way. But the intelligent type does so through the discovery of genuine faults. Both these types are uh, crude, unbecoming, untidy, both like sour, salty, bitter, strong tasting food. They do not like unpleasant sights and sounds. They can react with abusive words or hatred and violence. But the hating character shows grudges, uh, resentment, envy, jealousy, slander, pride, whereas the intellectual type is free from grudges and jealousy, is willing to take advice and likes doing good deeds. Then the third pair, the deluded and the speculative temperaments. The deluded character vacillates due to superficial understanding, whereas the speculative type is due to uh, empty speculation. So the deluded character is forgetful, confused, cannot distinguish right from wrong, is incapable of making judgments, he follows the opinion of others, he is inclined to sloth and torpor, whereas the speculative type is also following the opinion of others, but is lazy, wastes his time, and engages in useless chatter. It is important that the object for meditation should be suited to the character or the ability of the meditator. There is a very well-known story concerning two brothers called Pantaka, Maha Pantaka, Big Pantaka, and Chula Pantaka, Little Pantaka. Maha Pantaka had already ordained as a Buddhist monk, and then later his younger brother, Chula Pantaka, wanted to do so as well. Now, Chula Pantaka had a hard time. He practiced for about three months and showed himself to be unable to remember anything. And so his elder brother told him, I think you better go home to mother because you're not making a, a good effort <clears throat> at this monastic life. And so, rather sadly, his younger brother started to pack up and get ready to leave. When the Buddha saw him and said, what is going on? And Chula Pantika explained that he <clears throat> had not been able to make a success of monastic life and was therefore returning to lay life. And the Buddha said to him, Can you remember to repeat just one simple phrase? Rajo Haranam. Rajo Haranam. Which means defilements go away. And Chulapati said, Yes, okay, I will try to remember that, <clears throat> and so that was his practice. Now the Buddha had realized that in a previous life he had been a king and he had developed the habit of wiping his face clean with a cloth. And he used to say, defilements go away, defilements go away. 
And so when he continued with this practice, he did in fact become enlightened. All the Buddha's monks, <coughs> except for Trulapantaka, were invited one day to go to a meal by a lay supporter. And when they got there, Buddha said, where is, where is Chulapantika? Oh, we left him behind in, in the Vihara because he's not very good. So the Buddha said, okay, send somebody to call him. And so a man was sent to find Chulapantika. And when he came back, he was asked, did, did you find Chulapantika? Uh, well, I, I, I saw a thousand Chulapantikas. <laughs> and of course, by this stage, uh, Chulapantika had become uh, an enlightened being, an arahant, and had also developed a special power by which he was able to multiply the form of his body so people could see many different forms. So that's just an example of how it is very useful um, if the object for meditation is matched to the temperament of the meditator. In the case of the Buddha, of course, he was the supreme teacher. He could always identify the state of the mind of anybody he was talking to, and he therefore could give him a suitable object or suitable teaching. That is something which was a very special characteristic of the Buddha's. But the 40 objects of meditation, they are subdivided, first of all, into 10, what are called kasina. Kasina is a, is a device, meaning an entirety, or a whole, or a complete, or a totality. And this device can be made from one of the four elements, earth, water, fire, air. It can also be colored, blue, yellow, red, or white. And the other two objects which can be used are space and light. But in the case of, say, the earth casina, a disc is made and positioned a few feet in front of the meditator, and he just looks steadily at the disc and repeats silently, Earth, Earth, or um, tries to maintain his concentration on that object. What happens after that will come to in a moment. Then there are ten Objects of impurity, the word is asuba. These are ten stages of decay in a corpse. At that time <clears throat> in India, it was apparently not that difficult to see or find corpses, maybe being taken to the charnel ground for cremation. And of course, because of the the higher temperatures, the rate of deterioration would be more rapid than it is here. But there were ten stages through which the corpse could pass, and they are listed as a swollen corpse, discolored, festering, fissured, mangled, dismembered, cut and dismembered, blood-stained, worm-infested, and lastly, a skeleton. I think you can see very easily that this kind of object might very well be suitable for people who are of a lustful disposition. But, if this object were given to somebody who was not of a lustful disposition, then it could be 
um, at best unproductive, but it could also be damaging. Some people say that you can use either uh, an animal corpse, if you can't find a human corpse, or you can use your imagination and do the whole exercise through your imagination. So even if you can't get access to a real human corpse, there are alternatives. The next set of ten are called anusati, or recollections. The recollection of the virtues of the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. Recollection of ethical conduct, recollection of liberality or generosity, recollection of the devas, the heavenly beings, recollection of the qualities which they must have developed in order to be reborn as a heavenly being. And then uh, peace, peace of mind, tranquility, um, and the quality of Nibbāna, which is also peaceful uh, as the, the cessation of suffering. And then the next one is uh, Marana, uh, death, the uncertainty of life. Death can arise at any time, but it will arise sooner or later. One can reflect on the inevitability of one's death and prepare for it uh, suitably in a suitable fashion. And then number nine is kaya, the body, the 32 parts of the body, starting with bits of body which are easily visible, like um, hair of the head, hair of the body, uh, teeth, nails, and so forth. Then going into internal organs, lungs, heart, etc. And then the liquids which flow around the body, like blood. And by um, understanding that the body is made up of nothing other than these different parts, then one can reduce one's attachment to it as my body. All it is is a collection of bits and pieces. And then the last of these ten anusatis is mindfulness of breathing, anapana sati, which is probably the best known, most widely practiced uh, object. Then there are the four Brahma Vihara, the four divine abodes. The Buddha said that if we can develop these qualities here in this life now, then we can live as if we are divine beings. And the four are metta, loving kindness, um, karuna, compassion, mudita, sympathetic or appreciative joy, and upekka, equanimity. This is a very high uh, level of equanimity, the highly developed mind. This is not the same equanimity which we found when we were looking at the first few chittas arising in the karma vachara, the, the sense planes, where we had more or less uh, indifference as the translation for equanimity. Here is a very much higher uh, developed state. Then the next four are the four arupa jhanas, the formless jhanas of infinite space, infinite consciousness, 
nothingness and neither perception nor non-perception. We shall come to these in more detail uh, later. And then the 39th object is perception of the loathsomeness of food. This might strike us as a little bit peculiar because we spend a huge amount of time and effort finding, preparing, cooking and eating food. We make this into a very enjoyable activity. But this is all forms of sensual pleasure, sensual attachments. And monks are taught to regard food as simply fuel. Fuel to keep the body going so that the meditator can continue his spiritual development. And then the last one is Vavatana, the contemplation of the four great elements, earth, water, fire and air, or solidity, fluidity, heat and motion. Every material thing is composed of these four elements in different degrees. And by contemplating the nature of material objects, including our own body, we can see that they are all devoid of any lasting permanent quality because they are always in a state of change. When one of these objects is taken for serious meditation practice and this can lead to these higher states of mind we call jhana, the sequence of individual thought moments is not the same as the 17 thought moments which were uh, described in the very beginning, in the first class, when we are perceiving usually uh, objects coming through the external senses. In this case, we have the first three as they were in that uh, explanation. There's the Bhavanga, then there's the Bhavanga Chalana, or the vibrating Bhavanga, and then the Bhavanga Upacheda, the arresting Bhavanga. Then, number four is the Manodvara Vajana, that's the turning towards the mind door. And then, the next thought moment is called Parikama. This is the preliminary or initial thought moment preparing for what is to develop from this. Then number six is Upachara, sometimes known as access concentration or proximate concentration because this is close to the state of samadhi. At this stage, five hindrances are temporarily suspended. And then the next thought moment, anuloma, is called adaptation or conformity. This is adapting the mind to the next state to come. Now, these are all at this moment still in the karma vachara, the sense sphere planes. But at number eight, the thought moment is 
Gotrabu. Gotra means a lineage, and Gotrabu means breaking the connection with the sensual world, transcending the central sensual world, and crossing over into the jhanic plane. And then at number nine, we have the apana jhana, ecstatic concentration. This is the first rupa jhana, and it goes by the name of magga, magga chitta. The next two that follow are pala chitta. Uh, so, um, path consciousness and fruition consciousness. And after that, there can be another five Bhavanga moments to make up the total of 17. The problem we have is our mind is spoiled by what we call hindrances or nivarana. And this process of developing jhana suppresses these hindrances on a temporary basis. The five hindrances are Karma chanda, sense desire. Viapada, ill will. Thina midda, sloth and torpor. Udacha kukucha, restlessness and worry. And lastly, vichikicha. Skeptical doubt. They have each been likened to various states of water, which can be such that one cannot see one's reflection in the water, and in the same way, the hindrances, we cannot see what is to our own benefit and the benefit of others. So, um, karma chanda, sense desire, is likened to a debt or water mixed with various colours. So we can't see clearly. Viapada, sometimes called a disease, is like boiling water. The mind is in a state of turmoil. Thinamida, this imprisons the mind. So this is like water covered with moss, overgrown, and we cannot see through it. Udacha kukucha, restlessness and worry, likened to be in the state of slavery. This is like water perturbed and blown up by the wind. And vichikicha, sceptical doubt like being lost in a desert uh, without a map. Uh, and this is likened to turbid or muddy water again, through which you cannot see anything. All of these hindrances <coughs> arise due to a yoniso manasikara, unwise attention. If we pay attention to things in an unskillful way, then these hindrances arise. If we can, however, develop yoniso manasikara, wise attention, then we can begin to work on the hindrances and prevent them from arising. There are five jhanic factors which 
arise during this process of <clears throat> meditation on an object. And <clears throat> the first of these is called vitaka, the initial application of the mind to the object. It's likened to somebody who wants to see the king. He cannot just go up and see the king. He needs somebody to give him an introduction to the king. And so this is vitaka. It is the initial application of the mind to the object. <clears throat> there are two analogies. The first is it's like a bee landing on a flower. Or it's like a shipwrecked sailor making landfall, coming to dry land at last. And this first factor cannot be achieved by a lazy mind. So this can only be done if there is no sloth and torpor. So this particular jhanic factor, Vitaka, suppresses the hindrance of sloth and torpor. The second factor is vichara, the sustained application of the mind to the object, the continued pressure of the object of the mind on the object. So now the object is being studied more carefully in detail. The bee starts to explore the flower. Where exactly is the nectar that the bee wants? Or the sailor now starts to explore the island that he's reached. Where can he find uh, water? Where can he find firewood? He, he conducts a thorough investigation. And in the course of doing this, the meditator thinks, hmm, this practice is working. So I no longer have any doubt about it. So the um, hindrance of doubt, vichikicca, is now suppressed. The next factor is uh, joy or piti, delight, a pleasurable interest in the object. Call it elation, you can call it zest. This refreshes the mind. It creates a positive interest in the object. Therefore, this overcomes the hindrance of uh, via pada, um, anger and um, displeasure and dislike. I would mention here that some people have criticized the, <clears throat> the teaching of Buddhism because it mentions too much dukkha, suffering, gloom, and doom, misery, unhappiness, etc., etc. Well, this factor of piti is a very important part of the practice, and this is a very positive, enjoyable state. 
the PT then goes on to change into Sukha, which is a pleasant mental feeling. We can call it happiness, but it is not connected with sensual pleasures or material pleasures. It is really the outcome of renouncing these pleasures that um, leads to the arising of this state of sukkha. Uh, so now, while, while Piti had a rather excited uh, state, this is now the calming down of the mind. The mind becomes uh, peaceful, restful, and so this leads to the suppression of the hindrance of restlessness and worry. We can say that the shipwrecked sailor sees a clear pool of water. That is exciting for him. That is pity. But when he actually gets to drink it or bathe in it, that is more like sukkah. So now, the mind is becoming very calm and peaceful. The concentration becomes well established. And this leads to the development of ekagata, or one pointedness. This is the essence of concentration. One pointedness has been present in the four previous states, but now it becomes more prominent. And this leads to the suppression of sense desires. Together, that's the, the um, uh, hindrance of karma chanda. And then also there arises upeka, true equanimity. If you have your chart number 1.5, you will see all of these jhanic factors listed across the top of the chart. So, when all of these five jhanic factors have arisen and all the five hindrances have been suppressed, we have attained what is called the first state of jhana. Rupa jhana. Jhana based on a material object. If the practice is continued, then the um, states of mind become more refined. So the first thing to happen is the initial application. Vitaka. That drops away. It's like the person wishing to see the king. Now, he's had an introduction to the king. He doesn't need to keep on having an introduction to see the king. So, the, the first jhanic factor of vitaka falls away and we're left with just four jhanic factors. If the practice is continued, even the sustained application of vichara is no longer necessary and that drops away. So now we have just three factors, piti, sukha, ekagata. When piti goes away, then the mind is one stage more pure, 
and we have just Sukka and Upeka. And then lastly, even the uh, Sukka subsides and we're left with Upeka. This is a very pure state of mind in which all these hindrances have been suppressed. Not eliminated, but they have been suppressed. The mind is now very calm and the concentration is very deep. And the meditator may choose how long he wishes to stay in this state. But the problem with it is that these states of jhana are not permanent. And they were known even before the time of the Buddha. And the Buddha talked about them as Ditta Dhamma Sukha Vihara pleasant living in the present moment. So these states of jhana are very enjoyable and they can be even seductively enjoyable. People can get hooked on them and so a form of attachment develops. And the Buddha himself found these to be excellent ways of training the mind and also very pleasant experiences. But because they are impermanent, they are ultimately unsatisfactory. They don't lead to what the Buddha was looking for, which was a state of permanent happiness, enlightenment. So these states are very enjoyable, but they are impermanent. And when these states subside, then the hindrances will come back and we should be back in the everyday world with our normal uh, mind states. <laughs>